Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. It's a pleasure to have you here at the Arab Gulf States Institute. My name is Steve Sesh. I'm the Executive Vice President, and I'm very, very happy to be able to welcome today the uh, UAE Minister of Climate Change and the Environment, Dr. Thani Azayudi, who is on his way to New York uh, to attend the UN 2019 Climate Action Summit. It begins, I think you said, on Friday, Saturday. He's been spending his weekend um, engaged in these uh, matters. So uh, there's a lot of activity in this particular sphere, a lot of things, a lot of issues for us to talk about. And I'm very glad to have as many people uh, at this table who understand these issues as well as you all do to help the conversation. I'm sure it'll be rich and, and, and textured for the minister to enjoy himself um, during the course of the day. Mr. Minister, I'll invite you to open up the conversation. Thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Stephen, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here at the Arab State, uh, Arab Gulf States uh, Institute in Washington. Uh, in my 10 minutes remarks, I'm going to speak quickly about what we have uh, done so far for the last 15 years in the UAE and uh, where we, we're heading to in the field of climate change environment. And uh, <clears throat> let me just say a couple of uh, uh, stories which... Uh, we in the UE, we don't uh, uh, used to speak about uh, that much before. The whole world knows that the renewable energy is, has been spread out lately in the last 15 years. Uh, but uh, in, the, in the real implementation of renewable energy, it has been way, uh, way back in, in the UE, which has been really uh, piloted and then shared with, with so many other countries. In early 1980s, His Highness uh, Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan, the founder of UAE, uh, asked a group of scientists from the UAE University to uh, pilot uh, some of the solar pumps in his personal garden to test the technology and see how, how effective the technology is going to be in the field of agriculture. And after almost a year of uh, of uh, the experience, the results was an amazing. So he heard that there is a drought hitting Eritrea. So he asked the scientists and the people who work on the project to go and apply the same technology and take the solar pumps to Eritrea, where we ensure that the water is going to go up the hill and Eritrea to supply water to many agriculture area up the hill. In a few years after that the project has been implemented, the agriculture came back to, the, to that area. This is a simple example of a technology that has been taken seriously by the leader of the UAE or the founder of UAE. Simple example, and this what, whatever we're doing now in the UAE, it's the same principles which has been applied by His Highness, we're following the same path. When it comes to uh, the environment and the various ecological system, another excellent story how we can capitalize and use the, the, with the environmental and weather conditions around us so, so we can transform the, the uh, sustainability of or the economic growth in those nations. One of the interesting stories, and believe us, we as UAE uh, citizens or even the, the uh, people who are living in the UAE, we don't know about those stories until lately, where we commissioned one of the writers to go around the world in the public libraries and bring what His Highness did in the sustainable projects around the world. One of the nice stories as well, in the, which we managed together uh, throughout uh, the, that exercise, in the uh, Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast is a country which is very well known with, with, with its uh, chocolate uh, production. And His Highness in the 70s, mid-70s, in an exact year, 1976, he went on a trip in Africa, starting from Mauritania, and then he went around and he uh, visited as well uh, Ivory Coast. And the, the uh, situation in those countries were very poor. And he asked directly, what is the main tree or agriculture uh, uh, in the in the in the in those countries, and they told him that the chocolate is one of the main national tree in in in, in Ivory Coast, and he asked about the situation. They told him that it's dying, 
there is no interest. And I said, no, what I'm going to do is to invest in the uh, recultivations of the, the chocolate trees. And what he did is an amazing in transforming the whole nation, building a full system and full uh, sector depending on the chocolate trees. And nowadays, in each far, uh, five bars of chocolate around the world, we will have the chance of uh, uh, the, the, the trees which has been cultivated by his highness in the 70s. So he, he, know, he knew how, how to use the natural resources and the ecological system around us to build sustainable systems around, around the world. I'm sure many of you, especially the people who are studying the international uh, 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 directions or international interests of those countries, the African continents and the leaders of the African countries nowadays are talking about industrializing most of their work and uh, most of their uh, materials instead of just sending their own raw materials outside. And what His Highness did in the 70s and early 60s was just applying what the le African leaders are thinking about doing nowadays in their countries. Speaking about the UE environment and climate change uh, sector, <coughs> the stereotype about us that we are a desert nation, we're uh, very rich in hydrocarbon, and uh, we're very scarce when it comes to water, and that's absolutely right. But what we have done in the environment field is just amazing. And we even sometimes exceed so many other countries, which is very well known with their environmental stewardships globally. What we have done in the last 50 years is just uh, uh, a fantastic way of managing our ecological system and the various environmental species. We'll start with a couple of examples from the marine life, and then I'm going to dig into some of the uh, on-land species. The marine life that we have is something which is very close to the heart of the, the leaders of the UAE. 80% of our GDP is depending on the marine, especially that most of our oil and gas uh, investments and uh, reserves and uh, uh, resources are in the sea. The shipments that passes through our uh, sea, the, uh, the trade which you use to, to do and to communicate and to connect with, with, uh, with the world is through the sea. The bird, which, which used to be the, the main uh, source of the, uh, uh, the, the wealth to the nation before the, the discovery of, of the oil. But at the same time, we managed to protect most of the marine species that we have. The uh, dugong, for example, is very well known that it's available in Australia or in Florida or in many other countries. But we have the second largest number of dugong or the sea cows in the world hosted in the UAE. And we, t we took really very serious measures in the 70s, even before people start thinking about environments and the way that we manage and protect this species. Not only that, we're very uh, uh, tough when it comes to the overfishing. The regulations uh, and the implementation of such regulations is very aggressive. And we start seeing picking up in the fishery stocks in the UAE comparing to the world, to the rest of the world who's complaining about the reduction in the fishery stocks. The mangroves, which is very well known with the purification of the water, has been tripled in terms of the area in the, in the, in the ocean. And many excellent uh, examples that we have in the marine life. Speaking about the on-land uh, species, and as well in the 70s, we start noticing that the Arabian oryx is about to extend. So we took the, the, uh, the, 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 the topic very seriously. We start having our breeding centers. And nowadays, from a couple of bears of oryx, now we have more than 10,000 Arabian oryx in the UAE. Not only that, we're not doing, doing only the local species. We, we managed to breed the falcons, the hubara bastards, uh, the uh, Arabian leopards and many other local species. And now we, we are identifying even the red list of the species so we can start, uh, start working on the breeding centers uh, that's going to support or minimize the risk of them being extant. His Highness heard about the African oryx uh, being announced as an extant and, uh, from the wild. So what we did, we, we uh, brought bear of the uh, uh, of the African oryx from the uh, 
uh, some of the zoos uh, which which used to own those African oryx. Throughout the last uh, decades, we managed to breed them, and we sent back more than 120 to Chad, the main uh, home of the African uh, oryx, and then the number now reach uh, around 220 in the wildlife in one of the protected area in Chad. So we're not just doing it to the UAE, we're doing it to the globe. We have a couple of international funds to support such uh, species uh, breeding or uh, uh, the work which uh, going to uh, reduce the extensions of those uh, various species. When it comes to uh, climate change, it's a topic which uh, we have done an, uh, an excellent job uh, on in the last 15 years. Let me just tackle the topic from three main uh, elements, the uh, mitigation, adaptations, and uh, then the uh, youth engagements. Uh, in, uh, in mitigations, we, we started in, uh, in early uh, 2002, 2003, and the huge investments are renewable energy. And uh, nowadays, we're really proud of the prices that we're getting in the, in the, uh, from the production of renewable energy from the uh, solar uh, PVs and CSPs. We're talking about prices which even less than production of power from the conventional natural resources, mainly the natural gases. Uh, just two months ago, we commissioned one of the largest single-site PV projects, 1.1 gigawatt uh, PV project. We're talking about almost 3.2 million PV on that single site, and the price is 2.42 cents for kilowatt hour. Uh, we're, we're tending now another two gigawatt in the western part of Abu Dhabi, and we're, we're constructing one full complex called Sheikh Mohammed Rashid Solar, uh, uh, Solar Park, uh, aiming to reach five gigawatt by 2030. And the prices which we're getting on each phase of the construction of the, the park is just competing with the previous uh, numbers. Uh, we're not only focusing on the clean energy uh, investments on the supply. We're, uh, uh, we're even tackling the, 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 the efficiency, the supply, uh, the, uh, the demand. Uh, so uh, we, in the, uh, in the last five years, uh, reviewed most of the, uh, the tariffs. We slashed uh, many of the subsidies that we're giving to the, to the uh, various uh, people living in the UAE. And that improved the efficiency dramatically, especially when it comes to the residential area, which is the main uh, energy consumers in the UAE. Uh, <coughs> we are now transforming the, the, the cooling from the, uh, uh, the conventional cooling uh, systems to uh, centralized district uh, cooling systems. And that is going to have a huge uh, impact on the uh, reduction of the energy consumption, especially uh, it might reach even in some of the areas to 50%. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the investments as well in the uh, mitigations was, was in the oil and gas sector. Uh, we uh, commissioned uh, five years ago the first carbon capture storage in the region where we're uh, uh, reducing uh, something around 800,000 uh, CO2 from one of the steel uh, uh, sources. We're planning to uh, announce new uh, expansion of the projects next week during the climate summit. You're talking about almost six times higher than the the the, the first phase of the project. Uh, and the adaptation side, uh, side, which we managed to do in the last uh, three years, uh, we start linking the climate change to the health of people, where we're uh, uh, monitoring the health of people, the the uh, alerting people not to go outside during the uh, heat waves, during the movements of the air from one, one continent to the other where we're following up the, 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 the weather as well. Uh, uh, we start even doing some international, uh, international aid programs, especially in those areas where the tornadoes, the cyclones are hitting, the droughts. We know that the water supply is going to be disturbed. So most of the work that we're redirecting it toward, for example, the malaria uh, 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 aid programs in collaboration with the international partners, especially Bill Gates. So we're linking those uh, interna international uh, uh, weather conditions and severe weather conditions to the way that we're uh, supporting and investing in the, in the, uh, in the sector. Tackling the infrastructure, uh, I'm sure as uh, international experts, uh, you heard about the scientific studies which says that our area is not going to be livable in, in a few decades from now, especially with the high temperature expected that's going to be in the region reaching above the 60 degrees in the summer times. 
we uh, took those studies seriously and uh, we uh, analyzed those studies and start seeing the, the really the uh, the impact of high temperature on the uh, the infrastructure that we have and uh, I can I can uh, uh, in very confident manner say that it's not true uh, with the high temperature in the last few years during certain period uh, of the summer nothing happened to our infrastructure our infrastructure has been built in a way that it's more adaptable to such weather condition yes we have an issues and the issue when it comes to infrastructure is with the changing of the water the, the rainfall seasons and the the uh, the uh, the high quality the high uh, percentage of rainfall uh, during those uh, seasons is affecting our infrastructure so we really directed our studies toward having more resilient infrastructure uh, on that aspect the uh, uh, the other adaptation uh, element which we are taking seriously as well the, the in the energy sector we're not talking about only investments and in the infrastructure but also how the various weather conditions either the high temperature or the rainfall is going to disturb the distribution systems and how is that is going to affect as well the efficiency of the various uh, networks that we have something which we're taking now in consideration and we're doing further studies on that with our colleagues from the ministry of uh, energy and industry Taking the third topic, which is the uh, youth engagement. Uh, youth is uh, something which uh, uh, the leaders has been uh, included in the most of the work that we do in the uh, in the governments. After the appointment of the Minister of, uh, of Youth, uh, we start integrating them in the policy developments and the in the uh, uh, policy uh, uh, survey and, uh, the surveys that we do uh, in, with the society and how the youth are going to be part of the most of the discussion that we do in the climate change environments. We, we're really proud of the engagement of the, of the youth in the last uh, four uh, uh, international participation in the COPS, the Climate Change uh, Conference of Parties meetings. More than 50% of our, always, of our delegation are always uh, below 30s and are always 50% uh, uh, or even more are coming from the female. So we're taking those topics seriously in the way that we're running the business and uh, the, their engagement is really doing this major transformation in the way that we're looking at the sector. Uh, one last point, Ambassador, before I give, it, uh, give you the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we as well started an initiative uh, three years ago where we're encouraging the youth uh, to uh, redirect them toward being more entrepreneur in the field. We started an, an initiative called the Clicks, the Climate Change uh, Exchange Platform where we bring the financial institutions and business people to support those innovative uh, uh, ideas, those youth who have, uh, 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 who, who have uh, an idea which is going to tackle the climate change, uh, various challenges that we have, and even preparing them to present the right way in front of those uh, uh, financial institutions to ensure that we're, we're going to implement the, 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 their ideas. Uh, uh, we saw a couple of ideas uh, has been uh, uh, converted or been moving in progress uh, toward be becoming a business uh, 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 ideas and we're looking forward to continue this with so many it's not limited to the UAE uh, youth we, we usually invite uh, the, the rest of the youth uh, uh, from all over the world to participate with us thank you ambassador Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, that's a very, it's a great beginning. It really encapsulates the very ambitious agenda that the UAE has undertaken in the climate change uh, issue. And uh, let me begin, if I may, with a, it's kind of a process question, which betrays my own experience in government, trying to get government to work um, across the board and on citizens' behalf. But you've described this agenda, which clearly bumps up against equities and interests of other ministries in your government, the Ministry of Energy, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Finance. Is there a mechanism that coordinates all the different ministries and your priorities and those equities so you can deconflict uh, initiatives you want to do which may somehow compete against those of other ministers? Uh, one of the uh, steps which we took after the, uh, uh, the naming of the ministry as the Climate Change Ministry is uh, creating uh, something called the Climate Change Environment Council, uh, where representative from the various relevant ministries are part of that council. And we're not talking about a, a, a director level, we're talking about the undersecretaries who's, who are going to report directly to the 
minister on the various topics which we're talking which, which we're talking about in the in the uh, in the field of climate change environments so uh, the, the 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 ministries which uh, you, you you just mentioned the energy the uh, um, finance the infrastructure the health they're all are part of the the, uh, the the council and at the same time we have representatives from the local entities to ensure the implementation of those those policies and taking in consideration the 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 uh, uh, challenges or the the uh, various limitations that they have within the local uh, 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 level we added something else to tackle the private se sector engagement as well one third of the council consists of the private sector to ensure that we hear directly to them we know what exactly is going to be implemented and what exactly are not going to be implemented and we learn from them uh, the best practices so we ensure we take those ideas and thoughts within the policy developments even before we we uh, open the the uh, the laws or regulations uh, for public uh, opinions as well great uh, one more question then i will open it up to the floor um under the heading of an ambitious agenda, your government committed, I think, in 2016 that it would generate 27 percent of its total power requirements from non-carbon sources um, by 2021. Now, clearly, the Baraka nuclear power plant not coming online has been a big impediment to that. Um, how close will you be to the 2020 um, projections in, in the subsequent years? Uh, most of the projects are under construction, as most of the major pro projects globally. It takes some time, some delays are happening. That's why uh, the Baraka or the nuclear uh, uh, projects was supposed to be uh, uh, connected to the grub uh, two years ago. But I can assure you that we have a, a tough a target now, early next year, early 2020, it has to be connected. Uh, the renewable energy projects are picking up, so we're going to be close by the percentage which we announced uh, by 2020. But uh, I can assure you the nuclear, uh, at least two uh, plants of our nuclear uh, uh, power plants are going to be connected to the grid early next year. Ah, great, thank you very much. Okay, I will now open it up to questions. Are my microphones ready for distribution? Okay, we'll get one of you on each side perhaps. This is gonna be carefully choreographed. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your excellent presentation. I think you have been very modest about the accomplishment of the United Arab Emirates when it comes to renewable energy and the environmental issues. First of all, let me congratulate you on biting the bullet, as they say, and reducing the subsidy on fossil fuel. This has been a thorning issue, not only in the UAE, but in the entire Gulf countries. And I'm happy to report that most of them are doing that, but you have been ahead of the rest of them. You have also been very successful in doing the district cooling. District cooling is a system that is more efficient than other ways of cooling. It has been used in Kuwait. I used to work for the Kuwait Institute for Scientific Research, KISSER, and we have done lots of research on this. And it is a thing to do. So let me uh, say that this is the right thing to do, and you are doing it. Way back in the early 70s, I visited, I visited Gazirat Saadiyat, which is now is a major solar city. And this is a sort of a very important accomplishment for the UAE. Now, my question, if you like, I have two questions. First is the collaboration between Gulf countries in renewable energy and reducing fossil fuels. It seems to me that most of the Gulf countries, they work on their own, and there is very little collaboration. I think you should do more to collaborate more. The second question is diversification. If you really want to tackle the environmental issues and climate change, you have to diversify away from oil. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, regarding the first question, which is the collaboration between the GCC, uh, we, there, there are so many uh, collaborations through the GCC Secretariat, which we're doing, and uh, there is a direct contact or collaboration between us uh, as a GCC. We, uh, in the UE, we're trying to take the experience which we built in the last 15 years to the rest of the, uh, the region, and uh, we've been successful building uh, one of the uh, first uh, wind turbines, wind projects in, in Oman. 
and the project is about to be commissioned very soon. It's 50 megawatt projects. We we brought our international experience and uh, developed that project. The second experience, which we're really proud of, it has been announced earlier this year, is one of the lowest wind projects uh, prices uh, in, in the world. We're building in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's a project uh, 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 with a capacity of 400 megawatt. The price is almost 1.9 cents for kilowatt hour. The project has been uh, announced and it's under construction now. Uh, we're working cl- closely with our colleagues from uh, Bahrain and uh, Kuwait. So the collaboration is there. And the interest in diversifying the energy mix uh, is something which the whole GCC is taking seriously. It's not uh, it's not an optional uh, anymore to continue business as usual, depending on the hydrocarbon. The diversifications, which you're talking about, no, there is no country in the world which can do the diversifications in one night. They have very long term. And there are so many uh, countries which they're... they're uh, trying to make it as they, they have the this transformations or diversifications immediately, but it's going to take at least 20 to 30 years to do this major shift in the diversifications. What we have done in the last 15 years is amazing. We managed to reduce most of our electricity dependence from hydrocarbon to almost 99% depending on the natural gas. And this is a, one of the cleanest hydrocarbon sources that we have. Now, the, the, the next step is to ensure that we have the the uh, uh, the setup right when it comes to our nuclear uh, projects, which is going to be connected next year. Our renewable energy is under construction. So we have so many projects. Uh, around 1.5 gigawatts are already connected to the grid. We're expecting another uh, um, uh, three gigawatts to be connected by the end of next year. So the diversification is going to take some time. There is no solution which is going to shift it in one night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to go back to the nuclear energy topic. I, I recall when the Iranians were developing Boucher, there was some anxiety in the Emirates and other Gulf countries about possible uh, nuclear accidents and fallout. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the mood in the Gulf countries uh, about safety, security, vulnerabilities of nuclear energy plants. Um, given the tensions in the region, uh, you also have desal plants. You have other infrastructure things related to energy uh, and environment that could be targets. So I, I wonder if that is part of your portfolio or how do we get to some of the safety and security issues related to the sector? Thank you. It's a very interesting question. Thank you so much, Ellen, for raising that one. Safety and security is something which we take uh, uh, as um, one of the ma- the vital role of the whole work that we do. If there is no safety and security, we will not uh, even uh, uh, think about the starting of the construction of the project. Uh, we're, talk- we're talking about uh, a nuclear project with uh, uh, an allocation uh, uh, close to the water, which supplies most of the water in the whole GCC. So anything happen is going to to be a disaster to the whole region. So that's why the safety and security of the uh, of the of the project is something uh, we we talk seriously. I'll give you an uh, an incident happened after Fukushima uh, incident uh, uh, ten years ago. After the the incident happened, we stopped the work of, of our projects and we sent a couple of uh, uh, tens of our um, team members to Japan. So we know what happened what was the mistake, and how we can come back and improve the, the design and the way that we're going to run the, the, our nuclear uh, project. <coughs> and that has been taken in consideration, and we took most of the lessons learned from the Japanese uh, incidents into, uh, into our uh, program. Uh, from, from a civil and construction point of view, when it comes to our uh, project, it has been uh, built and ready a year ago. But we haven't started the project because we want to ensure that the minute that we press the button and we, we, we start the production of power from our nuclear, there is no way uh, to go back. And the safety and security are going to be there from the beginning. That's why the delay which we had in the last two years to ensure that there is no, uh, uh, there is no issue and there is no mistake in the project. Thank you, sir. Your Excellency, thank you. <laughs> Very much. I, I had a question on the water scarcity issue. You gave a very good talk at the last MENA World Economic Forum on desalination and other good initiatives that the UAE has taken. I'm interested on the 
regulatory side, whether there are specific guidelines, initiatives, or regulations when it comes to industrial water usage um, that are have been particularly effective? The water is a topic which if no, no government is talking it, they will kill themselves. The civilization and the history has died because their uh, being irresponsible toward the water. And I personally believe that the success which we had in the whole region is not because the, the hydrocarbon wealth that we have. It's because of the uh, bringing the desalination technologies to the, to the region and providing the, the drinkable water to the people. When it comes to uh, the, the water and the huge investments which we have in the, in the, uh, in the uh, UAE, uh, we, we and the, the, uh, our brothers from Saudis, we consider that 60% uh, of the desalination comes from, from those two countries. Uh, the investments in the uh, latest technology is crucial. We're moving now toward um, using the ROs uh, technologies. And we start piloting in the last uh, five years using the, uh, uh, the renewable energy or solar uh, in the desalination. The results is amazing. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, the uh, projects of one of the tenders which we're, uh, uh, we launched earlier this year uh, using the solar even brought the prices of producing water to a level where it's going to be very cheap to the consumers. Uh, it's not only the desalinations, it's but, but also the various technologies that we have to invest in. The tariff, which I, I mentioned uh, earlier, managed to reduce the uh, uh, huge consumptions uh, by, by, by our uh, people. But the investments and in the uh, converting the humidity to water as a technology is something which we're piloting so many technologies uh, nowadays. We're pushing the farmers to use more efficient uh, uh, agriculture uh, irrigation systems, which is more efficient. The uh, one thing which I mentioned during that uh, uh, forum is the huge investments which we're doing as well now in the uh, cloud seeding. And we now reach a level where uh, we can uh, ensure that the, quali the qua quantity of water or, of, or rainfall from uh, the, the any uh, cloud seeding that we do is going to be at least two to three times higher than the expected uh, uh, amount of rainfall. When it comes to the, the, the usage of uh, in the industrial uh, uh, sector, uh, there are two main issues. The, one, the first one is the discharge. The discharge uh, is under a major treatments, so, uh, and uh, we're becoming more and more uh, rigid and tough in the way that we're apply the, applying the regulation. Uh, we're, uh, uh, the, 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 the discharge water goes through purification uh, systems and even to a level where we can reuse it in the, in the at least in the landscaping uh, usages. Uh, and we built uh, one of the largest uh, uh, sewage water in the, in the region, uh, in Abu Dhabi, and we're building another one in Dubai as well, where we're going to redirect those uh, discharge and sewage water from, especially and mainly from the industrial uh, sector, uh, and reuse it at least for, uh, with the, uh, in, the, in the municipal affairs, uh, uh, various activities. The second issue which we have, the huge consumptions from the sector. And uh, what we're doing is we're trying to centralize the way that we're producing the, the, the water or desalinate the water instead of just letting the, those uh, heavy industries to have their own desalination plants on the sites and redirect it to the, to the main companies to ensure that they're going to uh, uh, use it in more efficient ways. Thank you. My question is, a, in a way, a follow-up uh, to the discussion on diversification. Because indeed, the experience of all resource-rich countries shows that diversification is a is a difficult and long-term process. Um, but that, from the other hand, the traditional way that especially hydrocarbon-rich countries have diversified is by branching from the extractive in industries to the downstream-related sectors. And uh, that in itself is always very challenging. Uh, 
Uh, but now we are living in a world where this type of diversification, uh, where you diversify from from extract from hydrocarbon extraction to the heavy industry and emission intensive industry that uses um, oil and gas as input, um, such a diversification strategy can face another serious challenge, which is the policy actions of other countries that buy these products from petrochemical industry, from metals, from heavy industry, and uh, you know they may be concerned about the carbon content of these of these products. So uh, you know. UEA is again ahead of all other countries in the Gulf uh, in pursuing diversification beyond not only oil and gas, but also beyond the whole value chain related to oil and gas, you know, through the initiatives such as City of Mazdar and a lot of other kind of high tech technology. But, that, but, you know, my question to you is, you know, just going beyond diversification of the power sector, going beyond, you know, some important steps that you have done with the energy price signals, uh, especially to the final consumers, you know, what are the other instruments that you are thinking of embedding in the menu of policies um, that would push the diversification envelope and attract more private sector, um, both domestic uh, investors as well as FDIs, into those sectors that are negatively correlated with oil and gas, that are not even in the same product space, but complete kind of reinvent the comparative advantage of, of the country beyond and far away from what you are known for. Thank you. It's a very long term uh, question, uh, I would say. Uh, that uh, is going to come for sure uh, in the way. But uh, the, the uh, diversifications uh, in the hydrocarbon has to happen just in a state of just uh, de heavily uh, being heavily dependent on being the raw material directly to the market the the uh, the investments in the petro petrochemical sector we went beyond the 2021 target which is the 27 percent clean energy and we're targeting to reach 50 percent uh, clean energy by uh, 2050 and 70 percent of the the our current emissions is going to be reduced. So uh, we already talk those v mega investments and the various heavy industries and considerations and the way that going, we are going to reduce our emission by 2050. Uh, looking at the uh, what exactly the, the, the distributions of the emissions in the various sector that we have, 80% of the emissions or the, the carbon emissions that comes uh, from the UE is coming from the mainly the energy sources oil and gas, electricity, industries, as well as transportation. So 60% of that, 80% is going to be slashed by 2050. Not only that, we're taking the, uh, uh, well, we're looking at various technologies uh, seriously. The environmental impact assessments has to be uh, there whenever we approve those, uh, those projects. If they don't apply the right environmental measures from the beginning and during the plan, will not accept it. Uh, the carbon capture storage expansion, which we're going to announce next uh, uh, next week, is going to be part of the emission reduction in those heavy industries as well. So the technologies are going to be a major role in reducing the emissions from those those sectors. Are we encouraging them to use the renewables to reduce their energy consumptions? Absolutely. And we have an excellent examples from private sectors who are already taking the lead on that. We have the Majid Futaim Group, for example. They have 2040 uh, in its positive uh, strategy. We have uh, Nabuda. They have uh, already 7% target of, uh, uh, of renewables. We have one of the largest sites in the DB, DB World, Dubai Port uh, sites, where they have solar on their, on their uh, sites. So we have already an excellent example from the, uh, the private sector and the heavy industries taking the environmental, uh, the sustainable practices on board in, their, in, their, in the way that they're running their business. Thank you. Steve, if you'll permit me, I have three short questions around the same topic, and that's to the solar panels. Um, one of the negative parts about uh, solar panels is they're very low in energy density. So when you make a land use decision, do you have any resistance to uh, allocating the land for the low density energy generation? I mean, very few people want to look out their living room window and see a solar farm. So you know, how does that work? Second question around the same theme is, um, 
it's well known and appreciated by engineers and scientists that a solar panel operating at 120 degrees has much lower efficiency than a solar panel in Southern California at 80 degrees. What is your, uh, in practice, loss of efficiency due to the heat of the region? And then thirdly, um, if I may, uh, a one or two cents per kilowatt is an extremely attractive price for the energy generated, but how are you accounting for the cost of capital? I mean, is there zero cost? Of, the return on capital is zero? Is it a negative return? You just take money and never pay it back? Or how does that work? First question regarding the, the uh, location of the various uh, solar projects, they're mainly away from the various communities, so we don't have uh, the people having access to them on in, in, uh, uh, a daily basis, uh, especially that they're very close to the, very, to, the, to the area where there is a water or to the area where the, the main uh, network distribution are located. So uh, we don't have that accessibility from the public to them on a daily basis. So we don't have an issue with the people complaining about the BBs. And uh, the way uh, which we're running the last one, the 1.1 gigawatt project is, in terms of the cleaning, uh, because of the dusty environments that we have, we have a robot, a ro robot which cleans the whole uh, system uh, without the human interference in the, in the uh, project. The second, pro se second question, which is about the temperature. Temperature, we know that the efficiency is going to be affected. But what we did at the beginning of the, uh, the uh, experience uh, in the renewable energy, uh, uh, during the establishment of MUSTAR, we did not jump into the technology directly. What we did is we invited the more than 42 companies uh, of PV, various PV providers to come and uh, pilot their uh, PVs. And it's, uh, those PVs were connected to one system, and we were comparing the various uh, uh, the results or the efficiency and the productivity of those PVs for almost two years with various conditions: the humidities, dust, the clouds, uh, and the the the, uh, the various weather conditions that we have. And after that, we selected the best technology, which is more tailored to our own environments. So the efficiency were not that uh, that low. Uh, uh, because we, for two years, piloted, tested, and then we selected the technology that we want. The, uh, we're not doing the uh, renewable energy investments for, for the sake of uh, only uh, um, the investments. It's, most of them are for economic uh, uh, purpose. The payback is from seven to 10 years. So with the economic uh, aspects of the pro those projects, uh, have been taken into consideration while developing those projects. So we're not doing it only for the sake of investing in those, in those projects. You know, the return on capital, what's the uh, The minimum which we're always looking at is the rate of return is around 12%. So 10 to 12% is, is, is the, the, the gate to even start the discussion of those projects. Thank you. Um, I was very struck by your comments about, um, in terms of climate change impacts, uh, the heat and the temperature was not the thing that was affecting your infrastructure as much. It was more rainfall and precipitation. Can you talk more about what those impacts are and how the UAE is mitigating those impacts? We were uh, following up the, the international reports on the heat waves which uh, hit so many uh, countries around the world in the last two summers. And uh, some of the videos and some of the news which we received directly from the sources were uh, those high temperature, for example, in Portugal, Spain, India, and some parts of Canada get melted. The roads or the, the roofs of the, uh, uh, some of the houses or even the, the, uh, the metal on the signal, the road signals. At the same time, the sum of the temperature in our uh, region reached 57, 58, 59 degrees, and nothing happened, neither to the asphalt, neither to the uh, signals, or to the roofs, which means that the, the infrastructure which we have are more resilient to, the, to those high temperature. I'm not saying maybe it's, uh, uh, it will sustain the 65 if anything happened in the future, but so far we don't have that issue, especially in those high temperature uh, 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 peaks that we, we had in the last uh, few few years. But when it comes to the, to the rainfall, uh, we had uh, uh, disturbed rainfall seasons uh, in the last two years. Uh, for example, in 2000, 
16, we, for the first time in our history, we haven't had any rain in December. We, had, we, we start ha- having the, the rain in June, January and February. This year in uh, uh, April, for example, which we usually have a very modest uh, 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 quantity of rainfall, we had the highest in the whole history in, in terms of the, the rainfall. That caused so many holes in the main roads. They, they, the asphalt did not uh, uh, sustain the, 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 the huge uh, amount of water or rainfall during the, those uh, uh, months. So what we did with our colleagues uh, from the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure, we commissioned directly local universities to work on the, uh, uh, the best materials that we have to use uh, or additives that will add to the asphalt. Uh, which is going to be more uh, sustained to that to such uh, uh, conditions. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. I, I wanted to follow up on something uh, you mentioned, which is uh, the carbon capture and storage uh, ambitions that you that you plan to unveil next week. Um, if you could potentially give us a, a preview of those, um, and and in addition to that, I'm curious, having visited the Alriata plant, which is very impressive the world's only large-scale uh, steel carbon capture solution. Um, do you view yourselves as a solutions provider in the carbon capture space beyond your own borders, um, particularly given the new uh, financial incentives, tax incentives we have here in the United States with the 45Q tax credit? And if so, um, how do you then take credit for that as climate minister for uh, you know, uh, the UAE's role in exporting solutions outside of its own borders, outside of its own energy sector and industrial sector as well. Thank you. The CCS project started in 2008 in the UAE. Uh, I, was, I was one of the main project managers of the project when I was in Masdar. What we did is uh, we were screening most of the, uh, the various emission or carbon sources in, the, in Abu Dhabi. So the decision which we talk is the minimum uh, quantity that we're talking about for those sources has to be one million to make it economically visible for any investment. The the uh, ultimate goal for those uh, carbon or CO2 is to go to the oil and gas industry. We don't want to uh, uh, just store it under under the the uh, the ground, but we want to use it in a way that is going to encourage continuing the, the project. Uh, we selected the steel uh, uh, source because it's one of the uh, uh, one of the projects which is uh, very close to the pipelines which passes through the that location. And we started the project, especially the, the investments were too huge. Uh, and there was uh, some studies has to be done from the oil and gas to, to see what is the quality and what are the the various uh, uh, elements that are going to be included in the CO2, which is going to be injected in some of the oil reservoirs. Uh, three years uh, ago, we uh, started the, the injection, I mean, the, the, the uh, 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 redirecting the CO2, which comes out from the steel and redirected to the oil and gas industry. Next week, we're going to announce the, uh, the expansion. It's going to continue uh, um, uh, looking for more sources. The sources have been already identified, but the sources are going to be above 1 million, so we can have more CO2 uh, going toward the, 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 the project. The pilot which you, which you have uh, mentioned, for sure, I'm sure that our colleagues from the oil and gas industry, they heard about, and we're welcoming any partnerships. For sure, they will visit if uh, there is any uh, uh, partnership or collaboration uh, opportunity with, with them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to pick up on another element of collaboration. I think a lot of the questions we've had here today have been about collaboration, either across country or within. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on any coordin- on the role that your ministry might have with um, the UAE's and I guess particularly Abu Dhabi's foreign investment vehicles. I know that Adia, for example, is a signatory of the one of the One Planet Sovereign Wealth Fund investment initiative. And you know, there's still been questions of of how much where that framework is going. Um, I know there'll be meetings. I'm, but I'm just curious. It t- kind of ties into the last question about to what extent is the UAE trying to position itself as an exporter of some of this technology. 
Um, but also this broader question as a long-term investor thinking about the risk of stranded assets at home and abroad, to what extent is your ministry coordinating with, collaborating with um, these this sort of the, the, these major pools of capital that are going to be very important to setting the terms uh, that that help not only the UAE but others reach their climate goals. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not going to speak about Adia only, but also I'll add to it Abu Dhabi Development Fund as well. For uh, four years, there's, there was no interaction with Adia. To be honest and frank with you, especially uh, main, basically because they their investments are they 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 have a certain uh, uh, conditions and certain uh, rate of investments that they have to tackle. In 2016, uh, during the uh, Planet Summits in France, for the first time, most of the sovereign wealth funds from the whole region participated, mm-hmm. and the lead was from our side. So Adia participated in that in that summit, and we uh, uh, established a working group with the rest of the sovereign wealth funds, not only from the region but also from the world, where they, they, they were talking about almost five trillion US dollars going to be redirected toward more sustainable projects. And from there until now, there is almost a frequent uh, interaction between us as a Ministry of Climate Change and our colleagues at the uh, Adia and the way that they're running their business and they're taking into consideration most of the uh, sustainability and climate change aspects and the investments. The other, uh, the other uh, elements which I want to tackle or the other financial institution that we have is Abu Dhabi Development Fund. It's our, it's our international aid uh, uh, fund which we usually support the, the, the world. For the last eight years, we've been uh, <coughs> spending almost $1 billion in the various renewable energy around the world. Either through the direct engagements with IRENA, the various international renewable energy agency uh, IRENA members, uh, or we as, as, a, as a country, we go and support the various renewable energy or clean, project, uh, clean energy projects in, the, in those countries. One of the distinguished <coughs> one of the distinguished uh, experience that we have is in the Pacific, and now we're doing the same in the Caribbean. Those islands are very well known that they hit an an annual basis with the various uh, cyclones, tornadoes, which disturb their their, uh, energy systems. The agreement which we did with those small islands is we're going to support their energy system to ensure that there is a huge impact on their economies. With $50 million, we invested or we did projects in 11 small islands, and that did the major transformation in their lives. We did not go there only with the money, but also we took our international partners, for example, New Zealand, Australia, played the role, World Bank played the role in some of the, the areas, and we brought the right technology providers that's more tailored to their own conditions. For example, in uh, Fiji, they, as a government, requested certain projects based on their internal domestic uh, analysis or understanding of the situation. But we, we, we went there and we took our technical team and IRENA uh, experts to ensure that we, we, we develop the, uh, the human resources to ensure that after we leave, the project will not be stopped and will not stay there forever. So we ensure that there is uh, capacity building. At the same time, the technology providers are going to be tailored in a way that is more customized to them. So the project which we did uh, with them was a hybrid between a diesel and a solar. Whenever there is no solar, the diesel is going to continue running the the the, uh, the project, and whenever the solar is there, is there, it's going to reduce their dependence on diesel. The second. Uh, projects w- uh, which I want to, to, to touch on is the our wind projects in Samoa. And we, we did that project before the six summits uh, a few years ago. And we ensured that the project is going to be commissioned so we can't, they can showcase it to the world. And the technology which we brought were from France. And the wind turbine can be brought, can, can be, uh, uh, brought down during the cyclones or any, uh, any uh, weather conditions. And after that, the event is gone. They can put it up, and they they put it back on, uh, and they continue uh, having the the power. Those are the more tailored uh, technologies 
that we usually take with us in those international aid projects. We're doing the same now in the Caribbean. Uh, two years ago, after the uh, the 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 uh, the uh, disaster uh, uh, disastrous uh, cyclone hit Antigua and Barbuda, we worked with them in rebuilding some of their uh, uh, systems, and the, energy, uh, the renewable energy was taken consideration as well in those in those planning. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Rob Mogulnicki, I'm resident scholar here of political economy. Um, I was pleased to see that you were at Mustar before uh, before your current post, and I wanted to ask, how do government officials uh, like yourself strike the right balance between attracting international firms to, to the UAE, but also encouraging alignment with um, some of the climate change and environmental uh, initiatives that your ministry is championing? I know you've touched on various elements of this question uh, previously, but I'm specifically curious about um, challenges you've faced with, or your ministry has faced with international firms and how you've mitigated those, those challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. It's worth to mention something uh, that in the UAE we don't stop business. We work with the business uh, companies and ensuring that they adhere to the various regulations that we have without disturbing their uh, plan to, to uh, implement uh, and uh, continue their projects. The alignment which we do usually with the, uh, not only with the international companies, but also with the, the local ones, they have to go through the certain process. A certain process includes the, the approval from the municipal municipalities or the relevant entities, as well as the ministries in getting the right of the, the, the uh, approvals on the environmental impact assessments reports which they have to submit and from there we take it forward but i don't remember we stopping any project in the ue uh, if there is any issue we sit together we give them the, their our uh, uh, our uh, conservations and uh, uh, issue on on their proposal and they try to to accommodate as much as we, uh, as as we request and sometimes we reach a level where we change a little bit of the plan so we can both be be happy I'll give you an example. Sorry, no, sorry. Please, no, Basta. no, by no means. Go ahead. One of the one of the projects which we're uh, uh, doing now is the uh, hydro project in UAE. Uh, maybe some people will will be surprised surprising hearing that we're doing a hydro project. It's 350 megawatt hydro project in Dubai, where we're going to inject uh, or pump the water from the uh, the, the lower uh, dam to a newly under construction upper dam. Uh, during the uh, surplus and the energy uh, throughout uh, the year. And uh, during the summer, during the peak uh, uh, demand, we're going to open the the, uh, the upper uh, dam through a canal to uh, generate 250 megawatt uh, project. That, that This project is located in um, uh, close by, uh, in, in an area w which is close by to a protected area. So the, the developer came to us and said, we have to come up with a solution. And we work with them, so uh, uh, we reached a level where they accommodated most of the uh, requirements from our side, and we're happy to continue the projects, and they will do even uh, more than what's required from our side in terms of the species uh, breeding centers and environmental uh, projects around the, the projects to ensure that it's going to be even more environmental project. Thank you for being here for today, and thanks to all of you who've asked questions about economic diversification, which is sort of the most interesting part of all this to me. But I'd like to add a question about how you're linking economic diversification and reform to your climate goals. It seems like the, this has the potential to be mutually reinforcing, and also is a very positive way to sell both climate goals and the, and the economic diversification, both to your own population and as you go to international gatherings like the Climate Summit or the COP. So I'd like to hear how you're linking those in, in your public face in selling both of those plans to, to people who need to understand what you're doing. There are a couple of uh, messages which we use in the, uh, in the way that we're uh, trying to, when we try to convince them that there is economic uh, benefits of climate change. The first one, the first one uh, is we compare the investments after any uh, environmental uh, stream events happens, uh, if any, to the investments if we do it before that happen. And the prices is, uh, the comparison is, if we pay one, $1 now, the, the, pay, the pay later, uh, if anything happens, is going to be from 7 to, to, uh, to $10. Dollars. The second uh, uh, obvious uh, 
uh, example which we usually give is the renewable energy investment. Uh, the re renewable energy created a lot of jobs, uh, uh, contributed to the energy diversifications, and the, the, the environmental gain that we're having from the emission reduction is just amazing. So it's a model which we give them that the, the climate change is not a costly uh, uh, sector. No, there is a huge business uh, social aspect associated with it. One of the examples is renewables. The efficiency is another one. The public railway, railway the, the electrical public railway is another way. So we're trying to show them this, the, 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 the various cases. Uh, lately, the electrical cars are playing a role as well, especially with the boom is, is happening. So we're giving them the, the realities. Uh, we're, we're showcasing those uh, successful uh, projects which is happening. One of the, <clears throat> as well, uh, uh, example which I usually give is the uh, using the uh, solar uh, uh, generators and the construction sites instead of diesel uh, uh, generators as uh, is an, an example for uh, the creating jobs uh, SMEs has been created because of that the em environmental impact is just amazing because you're just stopping burning diesel and the cost is cheaper because they don't have to uh, bring a huge diesel generator to those sites the solar are usually more lighter thank you okay i don't see any additional pending questions uh, so let me invite myself quickly to ask one more uh, before we fold up our tent here. Um, and it follows up on what Samantha just asked you to some extent. And, and we often talk about the fact that the UAE enjoys a, a, demographic, a demographic advantage that maybe larger, more diverse um, countries don't. Um, but yet it must be a challenge to persuade your public to make the short-term painful kind of, you know, statements they have to make high electricity prices, cut your consumption, turn your air conditioners off for a long-term, not quite tangible goal, which is improving the life on the planet. Um, how do you convince people that this is really in their short-term as well as their long-term interest? Uh, we, we follow a couple of uh, ways of uh, doing, uh, doing that, Ambassador. The, the first one is we have to do a campaign a way ahead even before announcing the the decision, so they can they know that the the positive impact of a decision if we t take it is going to be one two three. The second one is uh, we usually do pilot and the pilot in a in a, in a certain area and we show the results, and from there we take it forward. For example, b before we we start the uh, review, reviewing the the tariff, we selected a couple of uh, uh, government commercial as, as well as individual uh, buildings and we start applying the the systems <coughs> on those on those uh, uh, buildings the result is amazing <coughs> and the prices which they start paying is way less than even the investments the payback is sometimes reached to 1.5 years <coughs> so we showcase those excellent examples to the people the uh, <coughs> Uh, another example which I want to touch on is <coughs> we stopped uh, uh, catching or fishing through the net. And uh, it, uh, we had huge resistance from the public because they, they thought it's going to have a huge impact on their re daily revenues. And uh, after applying it, the fishermen themselves came back to us saying, okay, the best decision, uh, best decision has been taken is by, by uh, banning the, uh, the, the, the fishing by nets. And we start seeing that, yes, we were not, we're not, we're not doing the, that huge investment to buy those equipments. We'll just go directly and buy a, a certain quantity and come back, but the prices went up. Uh, and we're generating money more than we used to do. So uh, uh, convincing people sometimes by piloting it or putting them and the, uh, and uh, read, uh, uh, show them the realities so they can be uh, supportive to the idea that we have. Okay, with that, I'm going to say thank you so much to Minister Zayudi for joining us today. Thank each of you for joining us um, as well. And we will now adjourn our session. If you'd like to stand around for a few minutes, I think the minister may have a moment while he finishes his dessert. To, uh, to converse with you. So thanks again very much, and please join me in thanking the minister. Thank you, sir. It's really a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for